Recently, I gave a talk about some of the work we've been doing on ammonia, liquid ammonia, and things dissolved in liquid ammonia, and what you can get out of measuring them. Now, unfortunately, yeah, it was kind of a one-man show, and videoing your own talk, eh, it's kind of fiddly to both operate the camera and give the talk. So, unfortunately, the beginning of the talk is missing um, because... <laughs> Uh, I, I did actually ask someone to push the record button, but uh, they kind of forgot to till a little later. Anyway, um, so all that happens in the beginning, the bit that you're missing, is I start off by telling people how you know something's interesting. And you know something's interesting when people start getting their cell phones out. That's when it gets serious in modern society. And of course, then I've got this video of everyone <laughs> clustered around our experiment with their cell phones out. Anyway, so that's all you're missing from the beginning of the talk. Um, and yeah, I've got to apologize that the camera focus at times does does wander a bit. And if you want a challenge, tell me what's weird about this talk. There is something, if you've ever been to a science talk, you will have never seen a a talk like this before. So see if you can spot what's different about this one. Something else. <laughs> As you can tell, we were totally in control of what we're doing. That's best in the background there. <laughs> so, um, some, uh, this was... Uh, so this is the story of how almost the weirdest thing in the universe meets Bessie. And it starts with something like most interesting stories. It's actually pretty boring. Um, in this case, it's an energy landscape uh, of an electron. Electrons happiest everywhere, energetically. So you bring along a proton or something, and you create a nice little potential well. Now the electrons are happiest down here in, in the bottom somewhere. And of course they have these various resonant frequencies that they're happy with, and in three-dimensional space they look like this. These are basically your S and your P orbitals, that sort of thing. And the transition between these absorbs or emits light, which is fascinating. But unfortunately, it's also boring. This is basically what all the matter in the universe uh, it kind of does. So, you know, you look to the heavens and uh, you, you have things like the Orion Nebula and all the, all the colours you see here. It's basically the transitions between these S and P orbitals in hydrogen atoms. And of course, if you take things a little closer to home, there's a lot of this stuff around. You know, this is, it's, it's common. It's, it's, it's always there. It's, 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 it's kind of like the current worst in Berlin. You just can't get away from it. So is there some way we can spice this up and make it interesting? Well, yes. Yes, there is. You see, let, let's imagine that we've got our same potential landscape and that we make it difficult for the electron to be anywhere else. Anywhere else but in the hole. And, you know, we sort of fill it up with matter or something. Uh, you know, the metaphor would be uh, the, the atom is like, I serve the best currywurst in, in Berlin, so everyone comes to me. This is like making everyone else is the worst currywurst in Berlin. The effect is still the same. Everyone ends up in the hole. So how would you create a hole like this? Um, well, it's got to be on a small scale. And one way you might do it is by bringing a couple of molecules in, molecules of dipoles on them. So here you've got your, your nitrogen with a negative charge, your hydrogen with a positive charge, creates a dipole. And so you would actually be favorable for your electron to sit somewhere in the middle there. Great. Um, what are the chances of getting something like that that you can actually study? Well, it turns out, and this, this is still just amazes me is you get a non-conducting liquid like ammonia, liquid ammonia, horrible stuff, um, liquefies about minus 30, and you just add some sodium to it, and it spontaneously dissolves. The electrons just fall off the metal, form solvated electrons, very much on this sort of uh, size scale, the solvated electrons about the size of an iodine uh, ion, and they just sit happily there in solution. Um, and this has been there for a long time. Um, but one of the more 
more direct things you can get about this is when you get your hydrogen atoms, you know, this is a, a very steep potential well, so the transition between these two orbitals is very well defined, and the highest energy transitions over here in the ultraviolet. Once you get onto the solvated electrons, this is a very poorly defined low energy cavity. So you get the same transition between essentially what is the S and the P orbitals, and it's way over here in the infrared. And not only that, because this is such a floppy cavity, it, it absorbs all the way across here. And if you absorb all the red light, it looks blue. So these solvated electrons are very strongly colored. And in fact, uh, this is one of the, uh, the, the examples I like to go for rather than just dissolving sodium into liquid ammonia. This is liquid ammonia here, and it's got a bit of electrolyte in there, some lithium chloride or something. And what I'm going to do is pour, uh, pass some electricity through it, and what you're going to see is the electrons are going to start falling off the wire and just going straight into solution. That's the actual holes with the electrons in them doing this sort of S to P transition is this blue color, which doesn't show up so well here, but anyway. Uh, it, it's very strongly colored, but this is only the entry level interesting stuff that the electrons do. So, uh, you'll recall earlier that we had some sodium potassium alloy, uh, liquid at room temperature. I'm going to freeze it down to about minus 30, so I can condense ammonia onto the surface of it. And as the ammonia comes through, you'll see it instantly goes golden in color. And then I'm going to blow some argon through, and the ammonia is going to evaporate off, and it's going to start to crystallize again. And you get some of these fascinating little dendrites that form, which are very pretty, not what this is about. The interesting thing is the gold here on the, on the, on the top. Um, and yeah, it, it, they, they really do grow the most fascinating little dendrites, and it depends on the metal composition and all sorts. But uh, if you actually get quite a lot of uh, ammonia condensed on this, uh, you'll get. There we go, that's about perfect. You get some of the low concentrated solvated electrons. This is where the electrons are essentially just sitting there, isolated in solution with this blue color. And here it's much higher concentration. This is some sort of weird hybrid metal, non-metal thing that... Uh, it, sodium is a metal, fairly decent conductor. Ammonia, non-conductor. Once you get up to this gold solution here, this conducts about as well as silver. It actually conducts much better than either uh, sodium or certainly the ammonia. So, this is now an interesting topic of study. And someone says, we've got to measure something about the, the, the potential landscape uh, of these electrons. Um, and enter, let's see, something that someone might be more familiar with. This is for photoelectron spectroscopy. And we're going to be doing it on liquids. These are liquid microjets. They're about the size of a human hair. Kind of fiddly experiment to do. Uh, and you've got to, get, you've got to hit that with an X-ray beam, also about the size of a human hair. And then you get some electrons off from that. And you measure the energy of those electrons in, in your photoelectron spectrometer. And that tells you something uh, about the landscape of the energy, uh, the energy landscape of what you've, the electrons you've knocked down. Now, ammonia is interesting stuff. That's actually liquid ammonia. Looks very much like liquid water. It's got a lot of the same properties of liquid water. If water was evil, <laughs> right? This is it, it's just horrific stuff to deal with. It, it, it's it's cryogenic. It, it, it liquefies about minus 30. All your taps don't start sealing anymore and all that sort of thing. It smells quite bad. Um, but you know, after a while, you sort of master the minor technical challenges. And eventually you can, we, we, we did it. We got a, a liquid microjet of ammonia. And um, so th these are some of the technical challenges you've got to cover. So this is formed at about 100,000 frames per second. And these are the, you know, the 100 micron sized jets. So you see they break into droplets. You've got to do all your measurements here somewhere before it breaks into droplets. When it breaks into droplets, you get these weird charging properties that completely screw up your, your energy measurements. So it, it, the, the, this is one of the fiddly things you've got to deal with. And the next one, you have no chance of seeing. But uh, this is, as you apply the vacuum, it starts nebulizing sooner and sooner. It 
So, you know, spraying a nice volatile liquid that boils at minus 30 into a vacuum chamber it is, is challenging. Nonetheless, we did actually manage to get it to work. And this is the photoelectron spectrum of knocking the easiest uh, electrons of ammonia. So what's our ammonia actually look like? Well, we've got our liquid ammonia, stuff we're interested in, and gaseous ammonia. And we've got two peaks here. Those two peaks correspond to two slightly different energy potential levels. The deeper one, um, obviously this is the deeper energy well, it takes more energy to knock this guy out. This guy is slightly shallower, um, and it's the other peak. And basically what you're looking at is this is the gas, this is the liquid. Um, you don't pay too much attention, by the way, to the size of the peak here. Peak shape is much more important. That tells you something about the energy profile of the cavity you've knocked the electron out of. Um, so, that, that, that's great. We've now measured our ammonia, and we've knocked some electrons off our ammonia, and we managed to do it for liquid ammonia. This is a good first step. But what we are really interested in is doing the electron solvating. Right? The, the electron in this, in this cavity. And again, you run into the technical challenges. This is difficult to do. The blue solution, uh, well, once you get into this, this inherits many of the properties of the sodium that you dissolved in there to make it, which means it's phenomenally air sensitive. Spray the stuff into air, it'll quite happily catch fire. But the thing that, that, that's most important here is you've got to get all of this out of a 100 micron nozzle. Even the slightest impurity in any of this, the nozzle clogs, the experiment is over. So doing this is hard. This is almost impossible. This requires miracles. Um, but, oh, and also, yeah, uh, aluminum seals. Uh, this stuff eats PTFE, any chlorinated plastic, forget about it. So things that you normally associate with being nice and stable for your kit, the rules change once you get into this stuff. Nonetheless, we did actually manage to get it to work. So that's actually our gold jet, and that's the hole which the, the photoelectrons are going through to the spectrometer behind it. So this was about 3 o'clock in, in the morning. The gold jet. The gold jet. Um, and what, what we're actually going to see here is it actually being measured on the spectrometer. Because uh, when it comes together, it, you, you, you've got to keep the golden moments. This, by the way, is all handmade. Um, and there's a great army of people here. Very fresh at 3 o'clock in the morning, as you can imagine. Um, and this is, is Rob and Lenny Luck, he will lots of happy people. <laughs> and that's it, that's it. That's it actually coming off the spectrometer. I'm not making this up. Right? So as you can see, uh, right, so um, we have our ammonia, and we have our two peaks for knocking the electrons off ammonia, one for the gas, one for the liquid. We have our blue solution, which looks mostly the same, um, and this is for our solvated electrons. So where the hell is it? Well, it's there. You might have to squint for this one. Um, now it, might, it might not look terribly big, but you don't really expect it to be terribly big. If you think about it, these are the electrons on every atom in the system. This is a dilute solution. You don't expect there to be a lot of signal there. And if you blow it up, and this is another pain in the ass, you've got to keep these things running for half an hour at a time to actually get these measurements. Quite fiddly to do, but nonetheless, it is possible. And then the gold solution, eh, you, you can just about see it there. So, um, what do we get out of this? Well, we got our, our potential well for gas, potential well for the liquid, that's for the ammonia, uh, the nitrogen's on ammonia, and then we got our cavity, uh, yeah, so the slightly lower energy one is for liquid ammonia, gaseous ammonia, and electrons just in these cavities, that's the energy for knocking them out. So, what do we actually get out of all of this? Well, you got the transition, from this blue solution where the electrons don't talk to each other, they're just isolated in solution. And then you're getting this transition to this weird metallic state. 
um, where the, they, you know, th this is where it gets this huge conductivity and the properties change very drastically. And you know, it, it's a low energy uh, uh, signal, um, but it, it, it's, it's nice to actually see this transition from the isolated electron to this sort of band structure much more reminiscent of, of metals. And, uh, as for always, this was by no means a one-man show. There's now an army of people here, and another army of people who aren't in this slide. Um, uh, me, Tillman, Ryan, we sort of did a lot of the experimental stuff. Uh, we got Vern Winter and Christian from the Fritz, uh, Steve Bradford from California, Rob, Eber, and Gareth, uh, who actually work at Bessie, and that's, that's what we measured. And the star of the show is in the background, that's Bessie. And that's the story of how maybe one of the weirdest things in the universe met Bessie. And for those of you who are bursting to know, what was so different about this talk? Well, there were almost no words on any of the slides. So it's always been kind of a beef of mine that uh, people tend to have slides, especially in science talks, slides that have like 10 times too much information on them. And not only that, there's just way too many words, you know, there's <clears throat> great passages of words of which you have zero chance of reading, especially if you're trying to listen to the guy giving the talk at the same time. So it's my personal preference that uh, you really ought to be explaining things and having stuff written there on the slides, especially if there's lots of it, just acts as a distraction in science talks. So that's just my personal preference. So there's basically no words on any of these slides. Almost the only direct words in the entire talk were boring and interesting. But it's one of those weird things that if no one actually had pointed it out to you, would you have actually noticed? Many thanks for watching and uh, see you next time.